10 years ago, I visited South Africa for my first and uh, until today only time. And um, I came with my family and we were struck here by the spirit that we saw. Uh, people here were, it had been 10 years since uh, the fall of apartheid, people here were focused on programming, not just for programming's sake, but as a way of contributing to their country and contributing to, to their continent, um, which set a, a high standard for me and for my wife and for our children as we went back. It's, uh, uh, it's not just about, you know, how are we going to make a buck? It's, it's not how are we going to be famous, but there's a, there's a bigger purpose to be served. And uh, uh, it was, frankly, a little intimidating at the time, something, something to live up to. So it, it's great to be back 10 years later. Um, I see less razor wire <laughs> than I did before, which I suppose is the downside of the South African experience. But uh, the first night, we were staying at a little B&B, &B and there was a snatch and grab right outside my window. So I hear this shattering glass and the woman screaming, and I thought, OK, well, wel welcome to South Africa. <laughs> But uh, nobody's stolen anything from me that I know of yet, so that's good. <laughs> and, uh, and it's great to be here. So uh, to begin with, I'd like to start by um, calling uh, some people up to the front. Let's see. It's nothing bad. <laughs> Not too bad. Oh. This is really a nasty trick. Do you know how bad South African names are to pronounce? <laughs> I thought, oh, they came to me, they said, okay, well, give away some books, this will be fun. I thought, oh, that'll be great to give away some books and I'll sign them and everything and I didn't think about the, what are these names gonna be like? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Dylan is a coach at BBD. Would you come up, please? That one was easy. Another one? Oh, OK. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> this involves a lot of uh, consonants. <sighs> like, is it more entertaining if I try to say it and really butcher it? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> These letters don't go in this order where I come from. <laughs> Just more to you. <laughs> they, like, <laughs> okay. Uh, you can't be mad at me if this is your name, okay? That's, if, as long as we're okay with that as ground rules. Okay. Shauswa uh, Molangu. X-O-U-S-W-A. See? Those letters don't go. I'm sorry if it's your name, but... And it's not your fault. It's like your parents. You can blame... So... Oh, yeah, yeah, and now because it's so much fun watching me do this, even if it is yours, it's worth not getting the book just so I have to read more names. Uh, Vaughn Lewis, oh, bless you. Vaughn, no? All right, I'm going to keep going. Best to start with a laugh, even if it's at my expense. Barry Myberg. Barry. Not here. If it's a name I can pronounce, you're not here. If it's a name I can't pronounce, you're not here. <laughs> this could be the entire hour, people. <laughs> Nosifu Mdo. Oh. <laughs> Yay! Here 
here is a book. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Joseph Coma. That one I can get all right. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> and for having a name like Joseph. Okay. Uh, I really, this was just the nastiest trick. Okay, Christina da Costa. What? Is that a bad thing? Okay, another one. <sighs> Dean Gerber. There we go. Yay. All right. All right. There we go. Thank you very much. All right, and that'll uh, conclude the conference. Thank you. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, and I haven't even started yet. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so uh, four and a half years ago, I joined Facebook, and uh, it was a little bit of an odd decision for both of us. Um, uh, most development at Facebook is, is strongly co-located. Uh, at that time, there weren't any remote offices, um, and my wife gave me the clear choice between working remotely and staying married. <laughs> so I, uh, I made that a condition of my employment, which, which was a little bit strange for Facebook. We ha both had to get used to it. Um, it was, uh, I, you know, I'm old, right? And I've worked at a lot of different companies. As a consultant, I've seen the inside of organizations from very small, very large. I had never seen, probably 50 places that I'd worked at in one, you know, with more than just a, a couple of days. And I had never seen any place like Facebook in my life. It was profoundly dislocating to me to go to Facebook and they'd tell me, well, here's how things work here. And I'd say, sure, sure. You know, how do things really work? But because the culture is so different at Facebook, when you go, you just, as a programmer, you start developing day one. And um, as an illustration of how things worked differently, the first task I got on the first day at Facebook, it said, uh, add relationship types of uh, civil union and domestic partnership. So, you know, married, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> I'm too irresponsible for a relationship, whatever. There's all those relationship types. And I was going to add civil union and domestic partnership to that as a, as a way of letting people express their identity if, uh, if they were in a non-traditional relationship. And uh, this was already a shock to me. You know, I'm a programmer, I write programs for other programmers my whole life. And here I am on the forefront of social change. It was already a little bit uncomfortable. So, all right, I'll get this started. So I, you know, st start looking around the code, where are all the relationships types, and um, figured out where I thought the changes needed to be made. And so I asked a, a more senior developer, well, you know, what, what exact f terms should we use for civil union and domestic partnership? And a senior engineer looked at me quizzically and said, well, how would I know? This is your task. And I thought, okay, okay, okay. So this was one of these I just don't believe it moments. So I said, I, I get it, personal responsibility, that's a great concept, but who decides what words go here? He said, it's your task. You decide. <laughs> okay, let me ask this question another way. 
where is the content strategy review committee so I can submit what I think the words should be? And he said, it's your task. Well, okay. So I proceeded to call some of my friends who might be using this feature. And I said, uh, does civil union, is that like, yeah, that's a thing, it's okay. Domestic partnership, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I could do that in, yes, you could do that. In okay, super, fantastic. Okay, so I'm typing it in. And uh, it took me a while. Usually we try and give people tasks that they can push the first week. It took me three weeks, because I was still trying to do things the old way my way, you know, the best way. <laughs> so it took me a long time compared to everybody else. But I got it in, pushed out on a Tuesday, and within half an hour, the, uh, the press noticed this change. So I was seeing screenshots and Reuters and CNN and CNBC and the BBC Facebook ads, civil union and domestic partnership to the relationship types, blah, blah, blah. And there'd be a little screenshot. And I'd say, those characters? I typed those characters with these <laughs> fingers. <laughs> oh, God, that, what, what a great feeling. This had never happened to me before, that, that other people cared, like people, not programmers, people cared about... <laughs> I hope I'm, I'm a programmer, too. I mean, uh, so if you're offended by that, uh, anyway. Yeah, well, too, too bad. It's the close. <laughs> it's the end of the conference. What are you going to do to me? <laughs> anyway, so I r r roll this out. Then came the, 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 the news reports. Then came the commentary. Uh, oh, this is a f fantastic Facebook's uh, forefront of social change. You know, I'm still thinking, my fingers did this. This is so cool. Then came the backlash, because there's always a backlash. At first, there was the right-wing backlash. Facebook is defiling the American family. And then came the left-wing backlash. Facebook is trying to, um, this was before uh, uh, marriage equality, you know, which really seems, this seems so quaint now, this story seems quaint, because in America it's just like, oh, you just get married, duh. But four years ago, it wasn't like that. So the left-wing backlash was, oh, Facebook's trying to put us in a little ghetto here, and, you know, we want real marriage, and uh, uh, uh. okay. So that was also a lesson to me about, you know, I can feel good about some of the things I do, but don't feel too good about other people's commentary because you're going to get the other side and you don't want to feel too bad about other people's commentary either. But as of that day, I was hooked on Facebook. This idea that I could take my skills and use them in service to a substantial portion of the world's population, like, oh, it just feels wonderful to be able to work at that scale. As I got to know Facebook, many of the policies and it, it, like the way we develop software really still boggled my mind. It took me six months of just being confused and disturbed all the time before I finally got to the, the acceptance stage. Okay, yes, this is how things really happen. There's, this isn't, there isn't a story that they tell new people and then how things really get done. This is really how things happen. And, uh, and it looks like chaos, but there's a deep, deep wisdom in the way Facebook engineering works. And I had to live that and observe it and participate in it for the next uh, four years before I felt like I had any kind of a handle on it to explain it to anybody else. So, this is a short summary. We have posters 
on the walls at Facebook, a fair number of posters. Uh, the difference, the posters that are on the walls at Facebook were made by people at Facebook. This isn't like some corporate thing. This was like somebody thought this was a good idea, so they did it. And we have a, we have, it's called the Analog Research Lab, where you can go to get training in doing silk screening, so you can take personal responsibility for writing up your own posters. So if you come up with an idea for a poster, it's your idea, you make it, if you want it to be put up on the walls, you put it up on the walls. If somebody else doesn't like it, they'll take it down off the walls. <laughs> it's, an, I had never thought of it, but this is exactly a great example. And, and this is the only poster that I have up in my office. So this is on the back of my door, so I see this every day. And it was the most astonishing thing to me at Facebook, especially at the scale. I'd worked with 100-person startups that already had 150 clicks of people blaming each other. N yeah, I don't know how they do that either. <laughs> but somehow everybody was able to say, oh, well, <laughs> fortunately that's not my department. And I came to Facebook and it just wasn't that way at all. That nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. So when my wife says, oh, messaging's down for me again, and I don't work on messaging, it doesn't matter. There's a non-zero probability that I'll go look at the statistics in real time of how messaging's going, and if there's a problem, uh, I'll go look at the source code of the system that's causing the problem, and uh, if I figure out how to fix it, I'll fix it. It, do, it doesn't matter that it's not my code or not my area because there's nothing at Facebook that's not my problem. It, it's hard to get used to this. It's really hard to get used to this at first. Um, you go from being used to having your own little part of the world. You know, okay, well, I do the, I do the iOS... Uh, animations for groups, that's my thing. And I own that, I'm comfortable in this little area. And the, my first reaction, being a kind of a, a attention deficit disorder kind of person, was to just go everywhere. <laughs> like, somebody would say something, I was completely interrupt driven, right? Somebody would just, <laughs> my wife would say, oh, messaging's down. Oh, I would, always, I would always work on that. And I had a hard time making progress on any one thing because I was so constantly distracted by other things that I could be doing. And I, I felt this sense of ownership. And Facebook, let's face it, is in the job of selling interesting interruptions. <laughs> well, this might be interesting. No? How about this? This might be interesting an ad, and this might be interesting. So it's really hard at first, it was really hard for me at first to get used to that. Uh, so it doesn't mean that I do everything, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the other 2,500 programmers, <laughs> and I'd be really, really busy. Um, but it does mean that it's very rare to hear the it's not my problem at Facebook. And it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If somebody does say, oh, well, that's not my problem, say in a, in a Facebook group. We use Facebook a lot at Facebook. <laughs> Which is actually a really cool thing, and I think lots of people will do it in the future. But um, if, if some, uh, lots of the conversations are, are public because of that I inside of Facebook. I worked on privacy. I could explain it, but it would take the rest of the hour. <laughs> um, we do take privacy very, very seriously, by the way. Uh, okay, so somebody says, oh, well, that's not my problem. They are going to get clear, direct, and immediate feedback that that's not how we do things. And I've seen people 
leave the company over that. If that's your attitude, it's going to be so uncomfortable for you to say, oh, well, that's not my problem. <laughs> you get the feedback, and it just it, it feels terrible. Because, frankly, everybody else there is not taking that same kind of attitude. And <clears throat> Facebook has been able to scale. It's now 12,000 employees and something like 2,000 or 2,500 programmers. Um, with this attitude much further than I'd ever seen before. You know, if it's, if it's two people in a room and you're just kind of, you're programming and you're marketing and you're, like this is a very natural thing. Everywhere else that I'd ever been that was more than two people had already developed this sense of, well, that's not my problem. And somehow Facebook avoided that. So, I wanted to dig into that, and I think this is really the fundamental principle uh, that, that makes Facebook different as a place to work and has some lessons for other people. W one of the things I had to get used to at Facebook is how, just how intensely interested people are in how things work inside. So, for a couple of years, I'd want to talk about some you know, new idea that I'd come up with, or this new power law I discovered, or something, and and then and people would say, yeah, yeah, but uh, t t tell me what goes on inside of Facebook. I'm like, I have a good idea. Can I talk about my idea? Yeah, yeah. After you tell me what goes on inside of Facebook. Okay. So, anyway, I, th I I came up with the this following framework to talk about how personal responsibility both is encouraged and is exploited. Exploited sounds like a negative thing. If everyone's taking personal responsibility inside of an organization, you can move much lighter than if everyone's trying to protect from other people not taking responsibility. So when I say exploited, I mean we can do things inside of Facebook that look crazy from the outside because we know that we're taking responsibility and the people we're working with are taking responsibility. That's what I mean by exploited. It's not like, well, you exploit this by having you work 400 hours a week and not seeing your children and so on. That's stupid. So we don't do that, generally speaking. <laughs> If you want to work 400 hours a week, that's up to you, but you will get clear and direct feedback about the consequences of that decision. So, anyway, th I, uh, I put this together into 13 policies. These are engineering policies. I don't, I don't have a great word for it. The policy seemed like a, a good enough place to start. Um, and. Every one of these policies both encourages personal responsibility and takes advantage of it to make development m more agile. Uh, although agile is not a thing that you would hear inside of Facebook. Yeah, every, about every six months I'll get a panicked email from somebody who said, oh, I heard you were working at Facebook, so I came to work here, and nobody does XP. Like, what's going on? And I have to tell them, well, we're kind of, we're, do you have dogs? <laughs> have you ever tried to point to something, to point out something to a dog? And the dog looks at your finger. <laughs> yeah? And you're like, no, 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 over there. And they just, <laughs> this is extreme programming. And personal responsibility is what I was trying to point at in my own way. So that's why we, we, we wouldn't call what we do XP or Agile. We just, it's how Facebook does engineering. So it's, it's divided up into uh, what team you're on, po policies around what team you're on, policies around setting and tracking goals, policies around uh, giving and receiving feedback and policies, I put in the general category of technique. These are specific things that we, we do 
that didn't fit into any of the other three, so I called it technique. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you gotta have a reason for everything, even if it's a bad reason, it's better. So what I'm gonna do now, how much time? 35 minutes. Okay. Um, I've explored each of these topics in, in more detail. I'm going to talk about, like, the highlights. I won't talk about everything. If you have a question about one of them and what it means, um, feel free to, like, track me down afterwards and ask me or, or, or whatever. Um, so let me start with the allocation process, because this I just didn't believe. This was the, the first, you walk in the door, and you say, okay, what team am I working on? And they say, how would I know? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, of course that's true, that somebody else can't decide for you what team you should work on, but everybody does decide for you what team you should work on, so really, what team am I going to work on? And they say, how would I know? You have to decide that. So here's how it works. When you interview at Facebook, you get hired by Facebook engineering. Poof. That's, that's as close as you get to an allocation. I suppose if you got there and you decided you really wanted to work in sales, you could probably do that. Might be a little more complicated, but you could, I'm like, no, if you should be working in sales, who, who am I to tell you that you should be programming? Um, so, you're, you're hired by Facebook in general. You may have an idea of where you want to work, or you may not. I had no idea what I was going to do when I joined. I just thought it was better than starving. So, <laughs> did, did I say that out loud? Okay, never mind. Um, so, you show up, and you get a stack of tasks. These are your boot camp tasks. And you have six weeks, and in the six weeks, you go to some classes, and you work on your tasks. Ideally, you uh, put code into production within the first two weeks. I've got some stats about when that actually happens, and it's like, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of people push code to production in the first two weeks of boot camp. So you're, you're in there, you're invested, you sit there uh, at one of the code pushes like three times a day, the, all the front end code, the web code gets pushed. So you sit there and you watch an IRC <laughs> and you just like, oh, I hope it didn't screw something up. And then sometimes you don't and that's good. And sometimes you do and then somebody fixes it, which is also good. Oh, that, that first, uh, first code push I had broke stories. <laughs> All of a sudden people started using this feature. They started changing it and then then the story that should say, you know, uh, to who have Faisal has changed his relationship to the civil union. Not that you did that. <laughs> just, you understand, I'm, I'm just illustrating, okay? That story didn't work because some idiot had, hadn't used symbolic constants. They just embedded the string, and I forgot to look for the string. And Anyway. But somebody else fixed it. Like, whoever had worked on the stories, fixed it, did a hot fix, pushed it out, and it was all fixed. Like, it was, everything was okay. So, you got this first six weeks, you're taking classes, you're doing tasks, and the tasks could be anywhere. I had, I had tasks in our uh, distributed memcache. I had this front-end task. I, I don't remember what else I did, but like, I'm just all over the place. So, it could be Android stuff, could be iOS stuff, could be PHP, JavaScript, C++. You don't know. You just got a bunch of tasks. And towards the end of that period, you start talking to teams. You say, oh, well, you know, I worked on this task with your team, and I kind of enjoyed it, and I thought you guys, uh, you know, I'd like to do some more of that. And um, they tell you about their team. It's not their job to recruit you, and it's not their job to reject you, because who knows best where you should go to work? You do. Personal responsibility. 
you're confronted from day one with the personal responsibility of choosing what you're going to do at Facebook that's going to have the most impact. Nobody else knows better than you do. So you get this six weeks, you do some stuff, and then you join a team. And the team that you join is your choice. Now, there's, a, there's some constraints on that. Everybody can't join the same team. Not that everybody would, but engineers like to think about problems like that. <laughs> so, so there are teams that are high pry, you know, that need engineers to come soon. And then there's, there's everybody else. And so you pick from the high pry teams. But if you really, really want to work for a team that's not on the high pry list, there's always the Shrep option. And Mike Shrepfer is the CTO. And if you're a boot camper, remember, you joined Facebook six weeks ago, you want to go to Shrep's office and you want to explain to him, no, I really, really want to work on machine learning for whatever, whatever, and, but they're fully stocked up. But I think I could have this kind of impact. If you convince Mike, then you can work on that team. Because whose responsibility is it to figure out where you should contribute to Facebook? Who knows the most about that decision? You do. The, co the company has no idea where you should work. So you come in and you're confronted with this extremely uncomfortable decision about where you should contribute the most to Facebook. And you actually do have more information about that than anybody else. So you're told, you're, it's insisted that you make that decision. This was, this was part of my culture shock when I joined Facebook. I came to the end of my six weeks. I went to my, my boot camp mentor. You, you know, you're assigned somebody to kind of walk you through this process. And I said, OK, OK, I, I understand this allocation thing that you tell people about. But really, where should I work? And she said, how should I know? <laughs> I, I, I get it. You know, propaganda. I'm good at that. But really, where should I work? How should I know? It took me two extra weeks, which are very uncomfortable weeks, by the way, to figure out uh, where I should work. And uh, like I just I couldn't believe that this was really true, that it was my responsibility to figure out where I should be contributing to Facebook. But that's really the way it happens. Do I, did I ask someone what I was going to get paid? That has nothing to do with the decision. So I came in at a fairly high level, or else, <laughs> you know, which complicates it, because I'm responsible. I'll talk about impact. I guess I'll talk about impact next, because it's a, an important part of the, of the picture. I'm responsible for finding a job that's suitable for my level. If you come in straight out of school, you're still responsible for finding a job that's suitable for your level, but you got a lot more options. It's harder to screw that up, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, and actually, I, my first two allocation decisions were big mistakes. So I worked on privacy first, and I didn't do very well. And then I worked on messaging infrastructure, and I also didn't do very well. So that's when I invented the job of coach. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't any coaches at Facebook. People are like, is that a thing? I said, yeah, because I just said it was a thing. <laughs> OK. So you think that if you do this for six months, you won't get fired at the end of it? I said, yeah, I, I, now that you put it that way, <laughs> I hope so. But uh, anyway, so that's the allocation process. So. It's easy to mess up personal responsibility. That's kind of the, the, the natural path, at least in, in our society, the way tech companies generally work. It's really easy to get the, it's not my problem, that's not my job. It's hard. You have to consciously create an environment of personal responsibility. So this is something that you have to work on that people aren't naturally 
necessarily good at when they come in. And some people can't handle it. Like, I eventually got over my culture shock, but some people never do. And those people don't stay very long at Facebook. Uh, because, it, like, it weighs on you. Every time I was at a knitting conference, and I was wearing some Facebook t-shirt or something, and this lady comes right up into my face and says, Facebook deleted all the data on my laptop. <laughs> now, in that moment, I would have loved to being able to say, you know, laptops aren't my responsibility. <laughs> but I knew that I couldn't. If I want to work in, a, in an organization that holds that really as a value, I have to take personal responsibility in this moment. It took me 20 minutes of uh, being empathetic, you know, which is not my natural state, <laughs> but I can, you know, I can practice. I can, I can look like I'm empathetic. You know, there's instructions for that. <laughs> so that's easy. But uh, uh, being empathetic and asking follow-up questions, and it turns out that her motherboard was gradually dying, and Facebook is the first thing that she, where she saw any, any symptoms of that. You know, Facebook started to look a little funny, and then two weeks later, her machine died, and she took it in, and they said, no, we can't recover the data. So Facebook deleted all of her data. Well, it took me 20 minutes of somebody who was pretty upset, but I, in that moment, I chose to take personal responsibility. Like, what if it really had, Facebook had deleted all of her data? Maybe I, there's nothing I could do about it, but I certainly could apologize honestly, in that moment. Now, fortunately, in this one, it's like, you know, uh, uh, Lenovo's fault or something, but, <laughs> which, you know, kind of makes me feel good, but doesn't make her feel good. So just being in that moment with somebody who says, oh, you got a Facebook shirt, you know, I hate the new timeline. Oh, you're the first person I've heard that from. today, <laughs> you know, it, like, it, uh, yeah, I own Timeline in the same way that I own everything else about the Facebook experience. It can be pretty uncomfortable, and you have to learn to manage it, because you can't actually solve all the problems, but there's nothing that's completely out of bounds for me, and that's true of all the people that I work with, which lets you work in a very different way. Let me... Oh, uh, hack a month is so much fun. Oh, I just published a, oops. All right. Uh, I just published a, uh, a paper about my hack a month project. If you want to see, look for prune. Uh, let's see. Let me talk about P50 goals and then I'll talk about impact because the two go together nicely. So, um, how do you set goals? Uh, different people set them different ways. Uh, there are, are a set of competing constraints to setting goals. You know, you want to set more ambitious goals so that you uh, push yourself and you don't waste time, but you don't want them to be so ambitious that you fail at goals because then you get punished. And so your head's kind of tugged, you know, somebody says, well, how much can you get done in the next six months? Just rough, like, what external accomplishments should I be able to, to see from the work that you do? And you're immediately set up with this dilemma, oh, man, you know, uh, I, I immediately think, well, what is it that you want me to say, you know, which is another layer of complexity. It's impossible to predict and I'm trying to guess what impossible thing you want me to predict. So, oh, it's just. so P50 goals. You set goals that you're 50% likely to achieve over a, a given period. So, you know, the Android app is starting up too slowly. You go measure, you say, okay, well, it takes 14 seconds you know, the, the, uh, the 90th percentile startup time is, is uh, 14 seconds, and we want to get it down 
to, well, what do we want to get it down to? What, what do we have ha a 50-50 chance of achieving? Well, it, I think we can get it to five seconds, but maybe not. We'll see. I think I have about a 50-50 chance. That's a P50 goal. You have a, a qualitative goal in mind that you want the app to feel snappy. Bloof, there it is. That's quality. You have a metric and you, a baseline. Here's what things are today. And you have a metric that you want to achieve. And you're 50% likely to achieve that goal. Now, this has some interesting implications. One, it means that every goal is a stretch goal. Two, it means that you should have a portfolio of goals. The wise engineer will have a portfolio of, of uncorrelated goals. You don't want all the goals to be actually about the same thing, because if you uh, don't achieve that, then consequences. Um, so you'd like to have this kind of portfolio. And then the evaluation of P50 goals is a lot more subtle than the evaluation of kind of the goals where you're supposed to check them all off. Because uh, as an as a evaluator of goals, you, some, you know, I'll come to you and say, OK, well, I, you know, I got A, B, and C, and I didn't get D, E, and F. Now, all six were important, or I wouldn't have set the goals. I didn't achieve three of them. I did achieve three of them. As an evaluator, now you need to be thinking, well, are A, B, and C really more important than D, E, and F? Was there a priority mistake here? Is that actually the best we could have hoped for? But it gives you, as an individual, a lot of freedom to take responsibility for the priority of your work. So, if at the beginning of some session, some review, our review cycle is six months long, um, I have, let's say I have six goals, and the first month I get a new, something new comes in. Somebody says, oh, the Android app is starting up too slow. We have to do something about it. If I have, if I have these kind of check mark, I have to get all the goals done, I'm just going to say, you, you call me in five months. And I've had people explicitly say this to me. Look, if I have goals, and, and we're getting close to the end of the review period, and something really important comes in, I'm not going to be interrupted. I'm going to get my, I'm going to check all of my check marks. If I don't check all of my check marks, if I don't achieve all of my goals, there's gonna, I'm, I'm going to be punished. Well, that's stupid. That system is set up to create the incentives for everybody to do the wrong thing. P50 goals, and I actually, uh, I ended up emailing Zuckerberg about this one, because I sort of went up the chain, like, where did P50 goals come from? And Zuck just sort of, out of thin air, picked this as a goal. By the way, he is an amazing technology executive. I, I wish that you could all be there in the, the, the weekly Q&As, because he just comes up with, you know, for somebody who's the same age as my oldest daughter, like, that sets up a relationship a certain way. <laughs> and he just blows me away. Um, oh, so one of, one of those was, uh, somebody was complaining about our org chart being deep. It t tends to be fairly deep compared to, say, Google. And that's, that's not the conventional wisdom of a flat organization. He says, I don't... I don't actually care about the responsibility, uh, the depth of the responsibility chart. What I care about is uh, how flat is the communication structure. And at Facebook, the communication structure is completely flat. I can email Zuck, I'll get a reply back. Um, where, you know, lots of big companies, if you emailed the CEO, there would be big guys with badly fitting suits standing behind you <laughs> within minutes. Um, so I just asked him, well, where did this come from? He said, well, I just, I wanted people to be ambitious with their goals. So 
if, if I'm facing P50 goals, I'm going to set ambitious goals because I only have to get half of them. If I achieve all of my goals, I have not done a good thing. All that means is either there's a small chance that I got really lucky or there's a large chance that I set the wrong goals for which I will receive clear, direct, and immediate feedback. <laughs> so achieving all your goals is not a good thing at Facebook. That means you screwed up. <laughs> and the next time around, you better set more ambitious goals or you'll get even more clear, immediate, and direct feedback. So that's what P50 goals. Oh, and I was talking about this uh, nice thing about P50 goals. Two months into, say, a review cycle, something new comes up. Ah, that's fine. If I'm smart, I will have already achieved one of my goals by then. So I got one. I can probably get another one you know, kind of worked in, and this new, one, new thing, too, that's really important, it's really important. Duh, I should be working on that. So I'm incented by this policy to set ambitious goals, to respond to feedback as it comes in. I mean, we're, I, I felt like crying after uh, the morning keynote. Like, why are we having these conversations 10 years ago? This seemed obvious, and, and still it's like, well, you know, agile people, they're just kind of bad. And it's like, no, no. Why are we still having this conversation? But it's exactly stuff like this. This might seem like a small issue. P50 goals, who cares? But if you have an incentive system set up that punishes people not achieving goals, you're going to get the goals that you get when people are incented to achieve all their goals. Duh. And it's too bad because goals can do so much more for you than that, than, than being this, this absolute minimum I should do and not get fired. Like, wh what a waste of goal setting. This is powerful mechanism, and we waste it because we want a simplistic way to figure out whether somebody did the good thing or not. Oh, did you achieve all your goals? And if not, you know, whoosh. <sighs> but it, I, it's stuff like that that really hurts agile in, in larger organizations. And we need to go back and be rethinking policies like that. Or we're 10 years from now, you know, I'll come and say, well, it's been 30 years since my first visit. <laughs> I don't know. I think this TDD stuff's about to catch on. <laughs> I, I am so bored by those conversations. We need to get past it, but it's, it's issues like this that, that really are going to make the... Uh, the, the difference, okay. No estimates, like, did you see my tweet about estimates? How many of you follow me on Twitter? Just random poll. Okay, cool. I'm not gonna say anything about the rest of you. <laughs> so impact. Um, at the end of a review cycle, you are measured by the impact that you had on Facebook. There are no gold stars for effort at Facebook. Doesn't matter how many hours you worked. Doesn't matter how much you cared. Doesn't matter how much passion you brought <laughs> to your job or how cross-functionally multi-dimensional impact. What impact did you have on Facebook? This is one of the most uncomfortable facets of working at Facebook because you can do everything right and roll snake eyes, just be unlucky, have very little impact, and you will receive clear, direct, and immediate feedback <laughs> that you have not had impact and that if you continue not having impact, you will not be working at Facebook. I I both hate and love this. I love it that everyone else is measured on impact. <laughs> 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 I 
and I hate that I am. <laughs> Except not really. I, once I'm used to it, it's okay. What it does is focuses my mind on what's really important. If I say I'm halfway through a review period and I can't see what impact I've had on Facebook, I better figure out something that fits into my P50 goals that's real impact. I better figure out some, some way of really making a difference. And, you know, every day you come into your work, you have lots of different things that you could do. Lots of different orders in which you could do things. Lots of different intensities with you, which you can uh, uh, tackle tasks. Even in the biggest, most bureaucratic company, you still have a lot of freedom. In Facebook, you have even more freedom. So, knowing that I'm going to be measured on impact means that I'm going to focus my attention on things that really matter. Um, impact, Facebook's a very data-informed company. I almost said driven, not driven data inform. So impact, the best impact is, uh, is measured quantitatively. So I've been doing this coaching stuff for three years, three and a half years now, and I got good qualitative feedback. The students I coached said, oh yeah, this was great, it really helped me. Their manager said I could see a big difference in maybe 80% of the cases. 20% of people I coach, I couldn't tell that I'd ever talked to them, but <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, but, but there was still this lingering doubt, like, okay, okay, everybody loves the coaching and they, you know, they think it's okay, but really, what is the impact? Can we measure the impact? So our HR department, which is an awesome HR department, as these things go, did their own study. They took students of coaching and an equivalent population of engineers who hadn't had coaching, and there was enough people at that point that they, there was some statistical significance, and they discovered that if an engineer was coached, that they were twice as likely to be promoted in the following year as somebody who wasn't <laughs> coached. Now, that's a story that's easy to tell. I can say, okay, so in, uh, in six months, I can coach eight, 10, maybe 12 people personally. So I make, uh, I'm, I'm partially responsible for four to six promotions per year, per six months, rather. So eight to, uh, eight to 12 promotions per year. How much is a promotion worth? I haven't figured out how to quantify that. But that's my impact. That's my very direct, specific impact. I'm going to talk about that. And now that I have, I'm teaching other coaches how to coach, we can, that expands, because there's 25 other senior engineers doing coaching at Facebook. Okay, so what's the impact? I can point to that exactly and say, okay, here's what I did. Nice thing about impact is, Sometimes, sometimes you do everything right and you just, you got unlucky. You know, like that. <laughs> okay, I didn't do everything right. I, I, I hitched my pants up. I thought that would be better. Okay, anyway. Um, but sometimes, like, it's Saturday, you go, oh, I wonder if I can make Chrome do the thingy thingy that would be really cool. And you do that. And uh, two weeks later, 10 million people are posting, f you know, 5% more likes than they used to because you integrated something with the browser. And to you, it was just a toss-off. It was just like, oh, I wonder if this, yeah. And you actually had impact. So sometimes you're old snake eyes, but sometimes you're old double sixes. And you have impact, and nobody, at come review time, nobody's going to say, he only spent two days on that. You know, you expect some reward for that. Here's this other person, they spent six months achieving half as many more likes, and you, you spent two days and you got twice as many likes out of, out of that. 
No, nobody cares how hard you worked on it because we're not measuring effort, we're measuring impact. So sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get unlucky, and you just have to learn to deal with the variance in that. It's uncomfortable, but um, it helps me, helps me to focus. Now, if I can do this without, okay. Um, what's, the, what's the most important five minutes of what else I have to say? As you can see, there's, there's a lot more stuff here. I'm thinking about is it, how geeky does this audience look? <laughs> Makes it complicated, so the answer to private levels is fun. You know. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this, because this is, this is a technical kind of thing. Say, uh, I'm building something that relies on something that you're building, right? Typical scenario in project management. I have to gauge when I think you're going to be done, which means I have to ask you some questions, and you have to give me some estimates. And then I have to gauge when I start to be ready about when I actually think you're going to be done, not what you told me. <laughs> and, then, and then something else comes up. You know, he wants you to do something, and, and he golfs with the boss's daughter, so he <laughs> gets you to put his thing in your queue before my thing, and then mine's going to be later, and, and, and. Okay, so that's a bad idea, but doesn't stop us all from doing it. It's just a bad idea, right? So the Facebook style is very different. If, uh, if say, you're building some back-end service, and I want to build a, a front-end feature on top of that, and you're not done yet, I have three options. I, I just don't accept the dependency. There's just no dependencies. There's no estimates. I can either just wait until you're finished. And then I know when you're going to be done, because you're done. <laughs> it's pathetic that that sounds profound. <laughs> or I can say, well, I'd like your service to do this new thing, so I'm going to go implement it. Because then I'm in control of, I know when it's going to get done, and I know what priority it has, number one. And I go do it. It does mean that you have to review my changes and get them into your code base, and you have to trust me enough to do that, and, you know, which is a whole separate set of social complexity around it, but it's kind of nice. Or I say, I don't need your, like you've got this big service and I only need this little thingy, so I'm just going to go build this little thingy that duplicates 5% of what your service does and my little extra thing, and I can, and I'll just have, there'll be two services solving the same problem. So those are my three options. We just don't accept dependencies in this kind of my prediction uh, based on your prediction of somebody else's prediction based on somebody else's prediction when, as Rebecca told us so clearly, you can't predict. It's another one of those, duh. So we just don't do that. Either I wait, I go and add, make the changes that I need made, or I build my own duplicate thing. Oh no, you're duplicating effort. Yeah. So, as opposed to this game of estimations and predictions and sliding deadlines, deadline. You know what a deadline was? In the American Civil War, they had these giant prisoner of war camps, and they didn't have enough money to build fences. So they drew a line, and if you stepped over the line, you were dead. <laughs> That's what a deadline is. <laughs> a deadline is not, oh, you didn't get done? Ah, that's too bad. I guess I won't get done either. But that's, that's not too bad. <laughs> Why 
why are we still having these conversations? Anyway, so at Facebook, this is very clear, dependency breaking. And yes, downstream, you know, if I build a distributed key value store and you build one and she builds one, someday somebody's going to have to put those together and someday somebody does. But it's a separate thing. If we're trying to get features out, then you just don't ac accept dependencies. And uh, it seems crazy to people who aren't used to working in this environment, but inside, it's heaven. Because you just, you don't spend all this time lying to each other. <laughs> Duh. Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to, to say up front is, uh, or in closing, up front, <laughs> now I'm getting confused. Uh, but I'm responsible for my own confusion as well as yours. Well, some of yours, <laughs> and only some of it. Um, this isn't the kind of uh, set of, oh, here's practices, let me pick one and go for it. it. If at most large companies that I've worked at, if you just instituted P50 goals, you would instantly get 50% of the productivity that you, like people would just slow down by half. Because they're like, well, I don't have to get everything done. I'll only do the half, and I'll decide which half. Actually, how's that different than today? <laughs> anyway, what, what I'm trying to say is personal responsibility is, as, a, as a value is something that has to be nurtured, that has to not be crushed. It means if, if, if somebody does make an, a, an estimate and they, they don't meet it, you can't go wag the finger, say, oh, this is horrible. This was two weeks late. Who cares? It's not a deadline because nobody's dead. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, you, you have to build an environment in which personal responsibility can thrive. And personal responsibility is not punished. Once you've done that, then these are natural consequences of that fundamental value. So just like going and doing one of these, just because that sounds pretty cool. Dependency breaking sounds cool. Let's just do that. Like you're going to be in a world of hurt because people aren't going to be taking personal responsibility because that's just kind of the way most engineering organizations work. If you wanted to move in this direction, um, I had a note recently called Idea to Impact which is my philosophy of, of moving like, towards something like personal responsibility. You start with yourself. You explain it badly to other people. <laughs> but you improve. And eventually, you're able to explain it well to other people. And then you can start broadcasting it and, and uh, spreading it more widely. I, I don't, it's the only process for having influence that I've ever found works. Um, and I can't skip any of the steps. So if you wanted to begin, if this, this world of personal responsibility sounds good to you, first thing to do is start living it yourself. It might be uncomfortable, especially if the people around you aren't living it, you know, because stuff runs downhill, right? And, and so if you're the one taking responsibility and nobody else is, like you get a whole pile of, of problems and everybody, you know, it's, and that can be uncomfortable until you realize, oh, well, that's okay. Like, I can do what I can do and I do that and I'm finished and if somebody wants to wag their finger and, you know, get some finger exercise, it's <laughs> not my problem. You know, your finger fitness is not my problem. <laughs> but you could start practicing it yourself or uh, if you're a really good programmer, of course, you're welcome to come interview at Facebook because we'd love to have you. <laughs> I had to get some kind of a shill in there some way because they paid for me to come here, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank my friend Barry Dwatsky for setting this up for uh, 10 years of JCSE and moving forward these ideas that I can make such a profound difference in the lives of engineers and the people that they serve um, for uh, uh, 
I wanted to say BDD, and that's wrong for uh, the sponsor BBD and the other sponsors for uh, supporting the conference financially. And I'd like to thank all of you very much for your time and attention, for my talk, for your participation throughout the whole conference. And uh, I hope we'll see all of you and at least a half of each of your friends next year. <laughs> thank you. How is impact measured? Um, when I got to Facebook, I thought that it would mostly be qualitative, that it would most, for me, for the kind of things I do. And what I discovered is even for the kinds of things that I do, you can come up with quantitative measures like the promotion velocity. Like I never would have thought of that before I went to Facebook. Um, at the same time, people are good about, why well, I said we're not data driven, we're data informed. The difference is the goals are qualitative. They, like the, there's a thing we're trying to achieve. We want people to feel good when they click that button, you know, when they start Facebook up. If how long startup takes is interfering with that feeling, then we can start measuring it. And we can say, well, we expect that if startup goes down, these other metrics will improve. But that's in service of, of, of this feeling that we'd like people to have. So um, I introduced a um, series of courses for new college graduates called Noob Academy. So uh, after you've been working for a couple of months, if you came straight out of school, you get an invitation to go to Noob Academy. And when I explained this idea to my director, uh, uh, so E3 is our lowest level. That's what you, if you're hired out of college, you, you come in as a three, and you have to learn basic hygiene in order to get promoted to a four. <laughs> Sorry, it's about what it is. His instant response, once he understood what I was trying to achieve with Noob Academy, he said, oh good, nobody should stay uh, an E3 for longer than one review cycle. Now, my instant response to that was, oh, crap, he really can measure whether this Noob Academy works or not. He'll know, I'll know, everybody will know whether this, you know, if I think, oh, this is just the best idea, but in fact, people aren't progressing faster, yeah, the whole world will know that I'm not having impact. On the other hand, I know the goal. I want maturing engineers and Promotion velocity is a way of measuring that. It's not perfect, but I, and I'm not going to confuse the two. But if I achieve my goal of helping engineers mature faster, for sure, that metric's going to change. So I don't, I don't teach to the test. I don't try and change the metric. I hate the uh, move the needle. You don't get to move the needle. Like, you don't get to move your, your uh, speedometer. Oh, I'm going 120 now. No, you're not. The needle says 120, and now your speedometer's broken. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? So I, I thought that it was going to be very, like it would be really hard, but now that it's a habit, it's, it's just like the next thing I think of is, oh, here's how we'll measure that. Yeah, which, so the comment is it seems like there's strong alignment in the company about where you, you want to go. And that's one of the geniuses of Zuckerberg's leadership style is that comes from the very top. You know, I was, I was uh, my first six months there, uh, costs were out of control. Costs were growing faster than revenue, faster than, than users. And so, like, everybody has, like, we, the, we, we need to make progress on re uh, making the cost per user 
uh, sublinear. Six months later, we'd achieved that. We'd made you know, profound gains in, in you know, all the way from the language implementation, the infrastructure, the applications, everything. We'd achieved that goal. And the next very clear goal is, you know what, we have to move to mobile. Stop thinking so much about, about cost per user. Don't worry about that. Worry about getting us onto mobile. And that was the moment I fell in love. I'm like, to have a leader who will say, I, this, this is not important anymore. I'd never heard anybody say that. It's always a both and, you know, the improv thing. You know, like, oh, yeah, performance is important, and, and so is revenue, and, and revenue is important, and, and, and so is features, and more platforms, and you, not, nobody ever takes anything away. This is, <laughs> as an engineer, it's just like, don't, you know, if you're working on performance, you keep working on performance, but everybody has lots of degrees of freedom of what they could work on, so the people who have degrees of freedom that had been working on performance, stop getting us, finding a strategy that gets us to live on mobile, because that's the future, that's what's going to make a difference. And so here's this company of, of 2,000 plus people turning on a dime. I'd never seen anything like that. I, I'd seen companies with 15 people who couldn't make a change that fast. I'm enthusing a little bit, sorry about that. But <laughs> I, I love it. I really do love, love this. Right, so so uh, the question is, when you're taking personal responsibility, there's a lot of support that has to be there, or you can't take responsibility. So the, I created this bug. How did that get found? Um, there are many, many feedback loops. One of the things I was shocked with was how few automated tests there were. And it's still, there are, there are pockets with beautiful tests, and there's other pockets with hardly any tests. Bigger than pockets. <laughs> with hardly any tests. But, but there are many, many, many feedback loops in place. So if I go make a change to, to the website, within minutes, uh, all 10,000 employees are using that. And I will receive clear, immediate, and direct feedback <laughs> if I screwed something up, for sure. And then, you know, code review and phase rollout and alpha programs and beta programs and so, like there's lots and lots of feedback mechanisms in place. So uh, including user complaints, you know, or, or the, like there's automated processing of logs and then there's, you know, here are user reports. So if that spikes, somebody's going to be on that right away, find out what's wrong. Usually they'll fix it. If you're the on-call person and you can fix it, you fix it because it's your personal responsibility. If you can't fix it, then it's your responsibility for finding somebody who can fix it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. How, do you, how do you create a relationship without only personal responsibility and personal responsibility? So how do you get, I've, I've used that phrase several times. I invented that just for you guys. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, it's just the universe speaks through me. So it does for everybody too, but so it's not so special. But so <laughs> don't give, to, pro tip, don't give talks jet lagged because you'll say what, <laughs> you'll end up saying what you mean and <laughs> sometimes that's not a good thing. Okay, so uh, how do you give clear, direct, and immediate feedback without damaging somebody else's personal responsibility? It's an art. It was done wrong to me many, many times, so I had many examples of how not to do it. Um, how do you learn to do it? I might not be the right person to ask. <laughs> um, so uh, I mean, there's a few things that I try to do. Like I try not to blame. Um, uh, I try not to use uh, 
If I'm explaining a problem, I, don't, I try not to use, say you, your code, your, like I'll say, hey, the, the error rate spiked. It's just a fact, as opposed to trying to place blame on somebody. It's up to you whether you take responsibility for that or not, you know, and if it's, if it's uh, an error rate that reflects, you know, where the error is being thrown by code that you just checked in, and you don't take personal responsibility for that, then we have a conversation at a different level <laughs> that's clear, direct, and immediate. But it tends to be self-reinforcing. That, for the most part, people are like that. When they're not like that, you, when somebody says, oh, the app is crashing all the time, I'm going to stop using the dog fooding app because I need to... I want my Facebook, like, you're just going to get landed on by a whole bunch of people saying, if you're upset by how many bugs there are in the Android app, the dog fooding version, as bad as your version is, my version's much, much, much worse. If I say, oh, I'm not going to dog food anymore, I'm going to get roasted, absolutely roasted. If, and if, if I don't like how, how crashy the uh, Android app is, I better go work on the Android app, huh? Like, duh. <laughs> if that's the most important thing for me, and I'm in a position to do that, of course I'll do that. So, did that answer your question? Sure. Well, with 2,500 developers all taking personal responsibility, how do you handle five people fixing the same problem at the same time? Because they're all taking responsibility and they're all through fixing it. Yeah, an interesting question. So, as I said, we use Facebook internally a lot. So, uh, if, uh, let's see. The, the worst case scenario is it's a big problem, it takes a lot of effort to solve. And five different people are doing it not knowing that the other five are doing it. It just doesn't happen. If it's big, it's going to get discussed on Facebook groups that we're all subscribed to. So I'm going to find out that, oh, yeah, you're working on that? I th I, oh, oh, I have a diff, but never mind. You get yours done first. Or I'll see it in code reviews because people tend to not have one gigantic diff. They'll have a sequence of small changes and I'll see the first one and it's likely that I'll see your change and go, oh, you're, are you solving that same problem? Yeah, fine. If it's a little thing, who cares? Because it's a little thing. It's just a small amount of duplication of effort and, you know, why commit suicide to try to avoid that? So what that means is it's also your personal responsibility to let others know what you're taking responsibility to do. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's lots of different ways of doing that from sitting next to each other, talking to people, posting about stuff, doing code reviews, submitting your stuff for code, you submitting your code for code review early, picking the right reviewers. There's lots of ways that happens. And none of them are perfect, but if you put them all together, they're pretty darn good. Okay, so I'll just, even though the, the auto, audio is good, I'll try and repeat your question. So there's this t tendency in development cultures to have heroes, the one point of failure. And 
Uh, so in Facebook, how do you avoid that? Yeah? Oh, you thought there was something good about heroes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never mind. It's another conversation I want to have again. Um, so practically speaking, what happens is, uh, like my immediate reaction is everybody's a hero in, in, in these kind of terms. Like you just, here's some problem, you know, Android startup time, and you just grab it and you fix it. But then you go on to something else. Because there's a million interesting problems at Facebook. There's far more interesting problems than there are engineers. So you're not going to hang on. And you're not going to be, well, I'm the guru of Android startup time. <laughs> you know, who would want to do that? Because I could be delving into the internals of, uh, you know, uh, iOS message dispatch, followed by, you know, working on the Clang compiler, followed by, like, people are bouncing all over the place. So everybody's a hero, but just not for very long. So th people do grab, I mean, the good thing about heroes is they grab problems and solve them. And the problem is they just hang on. And uh, at Facebook, there's too many interesting problems. I was talking with, uh, I shouldn't mention the company, so Microsoft, uh, manager. <laughs> I, I'm jet lagged. I'm, that's going to be my excuse for everything. All of these YouTube clips, it's all jet lagged. Thank you. Um, Microsoft manager said the big difference between Microsoft and Facebook is that Microsoft, if you had a good problem, you would defend it tooth and nail because there just weren't enough juicy problems to go around. And if somebody encroached on your turf, you'd kill them because you had to have a good problem. At Facebook, if somebody encroaches on your turf, you're delighted because you have three other things that you really want to work on, and you're just happy that somebody else is, is taking the banner on this thing that you were working on, so now you can get on to the next thing. That's also why we get away without estimates. People say, oh, if you don't have estimates, won't programmers just work on stuff longer and longer? Like, no. Because there's so much other interesting stuff to work on. You're not going to work on a problem a second longer than you have to because you want to get on to the next thing. And it's just it's such a wonderful environment to, to work in. Does that answer your question? So the question is, uh, if you have personal responsibility, you've got 2,500 people who each think that the elephant's shaped a particular way, how do you deliver a consistent um, experience to your users? And the answer is twofold. I'm going to try to be really careful here. So this is not like the official corporate answer, OK? This is an honest engineer answer. The first part of it is consistency is overrated. Honestly, if the Android app works a little different than the iOS app, works a little different than the mobile uh, website, works a little different than the main website, like, yeah, OK. But there is consistency of vision. So, so like tactical consistency, syntactic consistency. Like but, but vision. What we're trying to make the world more open and connected. That's what we're trying to do. And everybody is extremely clear about that. That's the passion. That's the mission. It's, it's one of the clearest statements of missions I've ever worked under. Because it's clear when you're doing it, and it's clear when you're not doing it. You're making the world more open and connected. If you can draw a line between what you're doing and making the world more open and connected, you're doing the right thing. And, and if, if there's some you know, s small scale inconsistencies along the way, that's the price you pay for making much rap more rapid progress on the mission, as opposed to having, like back to my first task, if I'd had to submit my verbiage to the content uh, review board, blah de blah de blah, and had to wait three months for an answer because, of course, they have a big backlog, 
and, 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 then it's that much longer before a million and a half people are using one of those relationship types in their, in their profiles. Before a million and a half people are able to say something publicly about their identity that matters to them. Like, it's not worth trying to achieve perfect low-level consistency at the expense of making real progress on the mission, which is what we're really trying to achieve. That matters. And if the price of that is some small scale inconsistencies, it happens. But on the other hand, one of the other policies is mobility. People move between teams all the time. Six months, nine months in a team, and then you move on. So that kind of consistency, like you just defeat it with uh, migrations, migratory programming. So yeah, there's some inconsistencies. It's not so bad, and it lets us address the big issue that we're trying to address, which is making the world more open and connected. Does that answer your question? Have I, uh, so the question is, have I done reviews of my personal responsibility? The company, does it, does it do any reviews on the personal responsibility? So, w w so d does it do reviews of personal responsibility like all the time, like every day? No, no, no. At whatever frequency, I'm just asking if you look back at that and, and improve on it. Do, Oh, it improves all the time. It, it improves. Uh, so it improves through feedback from all of your colleagues, uh, the people that you impact. If you do something that's irresponsible, somebody will tell you. I've I've been both the deliverer and the receiver of that feedback. Um, uh, there's, uh, Sheryl Sandberg has this book, Lean In, which means it, 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 the basic message is if there's an, something uncomfortable, you don't back away from it, you lean into it. You say, hey, you know, when you did this thing, I felt uncomfortable. And you have that conversation. It, 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 it feels bad in the moment, but after a while you realize, you know what, it's better if we do this. So feedback tends to be clear, direct, and immediate. Um, if there's not a corporate sense, we don't have a, a vice president of personal responsibility. <laughs> right? That would be the that would be the typical, you know, hierarchical. Oh well, this personal responsibility chief personal responsibility officer got that sorted. Next, it's not like that. It's something that everybody lives. If somebody you know, if somebody doesn't do it, they'll get feedback. I, this ah, sometimes is so hard explaining Facebook because, like, once you're in, I, I, I would have asked exactly the same question five years ago, and I would not have been able to understand my today answer either. <laughs> so, that's as far as I can go with that. I'm afraid. Sorry, Ernest. So this was, uh, <clears throat> I'll repeat the question. So it seems like, isn't it easy because we all use Facebook that we develop Facebook? Why is, it easy? is it necessary? Is it necessary? So, uh, and the short answer is, uh, <laughs> no, uh, 
kind of the wrong, it's, uh, uh, you, I want to say you've asked the wrong question, but I don't want to say that because that would be really confrontational and kind of a jerk thing for me to say. So I'm not going to say that. But, <laughs> no, I said I didn't say that. <laughs> Am I missing something, Faisal? All right, so we, we are, yes, we use Facebook, but we're not typical Facebook users, and we know that. We have 30-inch screens. Most people don't have 30-inch screens. We have really fast uh, network connections locally, so, and most people don't, and we know that. Like, I don't remember the exact number, but a, a large majority of people using Facebook aren't in the U.S. So can I answer my question? I think I know where you're going. Okay. So, so personal responsibility has led you to become users of your product, even if you aren't trying to use it. That's not where I was going. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer, though. So we do things, the way you take personal responsibility if you're not living the experience, is you go live the experience. So groups of engineers, ordinary engineers, not elite blah, blah, blahs, but like people, oh well, engineers, <laughs> will go travel around India and go, you know, and then you'll see these short posts, you know, uh, startup time in India is 65 seconds you morons. <laughs> and they have to, oh, well, what's going on? And then they come back and then they advocate for that. Or, um, I mean, it's explicit, explicitly why we have a development office in Tel Aviv. It's, you know, ping times to Tel Aviv are much worse than any of the other development centers. Uh, they have a much easier time reaching people um, who are in this, you know, this vast block of people that, that use Facebook that have even worse connections. So a lot of international stuff happens there because they're, it's easier for them to, be, to go be empathetic than it is. Um, we have the connectivity labs where you can go use all of the apps and simulate the crappy network connections all over the world. You know, you're just like, you're just like, oh, ben. yeah, yeah, exactly, oh, Joburg. <laughs> oh, that sucks. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, I, I've collected some already. Um, so, we, we, like we, we, we go be empathetic. We make the investment to do that. You know, and you'll, you'll go to some rural area and you'll say, well, you know, pick a username and a password, and they'll say, what's a password? Never encountered the concept of a password before because this is the first time they've ever seen anything online. Oh, well, you know, that's baked pretty deep. But we've got to figure out some way to do it. So how are we going to do it? We figure out some way of authenticating people without passwords because that's important. Does that make sense? Like, we, we know we're weird, and we work to, like, bridge that. And then every once in a while, somebody will forget that they're weird, and then somebody else will remind them. So the question is, how do teams get created and destroyed? And it's a, it's a completely emergent process. So as long as there's a problem for the team to address, the team will be in existence. And when the problem is solved, everybody's got better things to do. So then it just kind of scatters. And if something gets dropped on the floor for a while, well, it just doesn't hurt enough. You know, it was, we, we had big problems with, um, with source code control. You know, Git was just too slow for what we were using it for. People whine, whine, whine. One of my favorite t-shirts at Facebook says, uh, whine less, fix more. <laughs> so somebody finally said, okay, well, let's go fix it. And they tried to fix Git, and they couldn't do it, so we moved to Mercurial, and we hired you know, some of the Mercurial experts and so on. So, like, yeah, it was painful, and then we fixed it. Like, that seems like such an obvious process. And then if, the, if it's done, 
then you're not going to work on it anymore because you got other things that you, you know, Oculus, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Oculus is really cool, by the way. That 3D is, uh, immersion is the future. That's the platform of the future. If you're telling your, your kids, like, what to program, that's the thing. Anyway, and those are one more. No, uh, so the question is about uh, internet.org. So what, what decisions in particular? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I understand that vaguely, but not well enough to explain it. I, I know that governments, carriers, uh, the population, what the team's ready to do all factor into that, but I, I, don't, I don't have any detail. Okay, uh, we'll take the audience. 